Mr. Grobler, and I'm here to help you do well in life sciences. Now, I know you are working hard at home. You are studying, you're gaining knowledge, and that's very good, and you're going to do well in the exams. But today, we want to add to your knowledge by adding skills. Whatever science you're going to study after school, whether you grade 10, 11, or 12, you need skills. We're talking about scientific skills which are applied in all sciences. Now come and have a look and see what do I mean by which skills are we talking about. We're referring to what is a hypothesis. We'll be doing simple calculations such as percentage and average you need to understand. How to interpret data and graphs is very important because all scientists do that. Then, when you do an investigation or an experiment, you need your investigation to, it has to be reliable and it has to be valid. But what's the difference between the two? We'll be looking into that. And whenever we do science, you always hear about the variables. What are we talking about when we talk about different variables? So in thinking about that, we understand that there are some concepts that are very important. There are, what we've seen over the years is that some learners misinterpret or misunderstand certain concepts, very important concepts. And uh, what is interesting for us as teachers is that we see most learners actually make these mistakes. I want to highlight a few words that you should look out for in this discussion that you can get them right because they're not hard, but there are just some misunderstandings that we are going to clarify. Here they are. Will you be able to write a hypothesis? We will see that a hypothesis is a prediction. Now, when we look at this, we will apply it to some questions from past papers and see how can you make a statement which is a prediction and that we call a hypothesis. What is the difference between validity and reliability? There is a difference between the two. What is validity really and what is reliability? We'll be looking at that. And now we look at the variables. We find all over that learners don't understand the difference between an independent variable, dependent, and what are the controlled variables. And then whenever you set up any investigations, you always want to do something before the time, and these are called precautions. These are not safety measures. So we will be looking in detail by looking at questions on how to apply this. So when we talk about these examples, we want to always look at past papers. Very valuable to look at past question papers. Doesn't matter what grade you are or if you're a university student. Let's go into a question that will answer all these concepts that we've referred to that you can understand it better. So it shows here in question one, a certain grade 11 learner was assigned to investigate the effect of temperature on what? on the growth rate of pea plants. So it doesn't matter what plants, but it will be given to you in the question paper. And if they give you information that you're not familiar with, like here's a species name, Pison sativum, it doesn't matter. You will always come across terminology you don't know. But this young learner planted 10 seeds in potting soil, and then he kept the young plants in the classroom. So what did he do next? He now controlled, and take note, a scientist controls something. He controlled specifically the temperature because this is what he was testing. And then, how did he do it? He had certain precautions, like closing all doors and windows. And then he, once again, controlled. He regulated the what? The temperature by using an aircon. And then the extra information is given that the investigation lasted five days, and every day he did what? He controlled the temperature. So um, let's now look at the results. Now, even before the results, he would actually make a prediction. So before setting up the experiment, 
He would make a prediction. Now that prediction, we said, is called a hypothesis. Now, when I write here, before we get the result and before we do the experiment, we make a statement. A hypothesis is not a question. It's always a short statement of what is to come. What are you expecting? Then you do the experiment and you get results. Now when we look at the results after we've done it and we compile the stats and we put it all together, now you can start seeing some trends. Now that is what science is all about, spotting the trends and they're so easy. We can spot the trends in numbers, but to make it easier for yourself, you can take those numbers and put it in a graph. Then you have a picture, then it's even more clear. But let's look at these numbers after the experiment was done and let's see if we can spot the trend. So see here, if you look here, the temperature in the room is increasing. So he controlled that. And what's happening with the plant? It's growing, and it's growing quite fast. But the hotter it gets, the slower it grows. You can see here towards the high temperatures. It's not growing as fast. In fact, here the growth has stopped. So this is the ability that you must learn. You must develop the ability to make conclusions, see trends, and then you say, okay, now I realize I can see what's happening. I can see the temperature is having an effect on the growth of the stems and how fast they are growing. But coming back to before you would set up the experiment, what would be your prediction? Now remember, a prediction can't be wrong because everybody has got the right to predict something. And in the end, when you have your results, you can say, well, my prediction was wrong or my results have proven my hypothesis correctly. So if you look at the data here, what prediction will you make before the time? Because we love to ask that in the tests and the exams. Let's look at the data again. Can you make a prediction? If you look at this, now we have the advantage to have it afterwards. But can you make a prediction from this? Let's see. Because this question was asked, question 1.1, provide a hypothesis for this investigation. Let's hear from you learners. There where you are, state a hypothesis. It must be a one-liner, it must not be an explanation, and it must not be a question. Are you ready to make your prediction in this investigation? Let me put the answer on. There's the answer. The higher the temperature, the faster the plant will grow. Do you see it's a prediction, it's future tense? You predict this before you start. So you show how the cause will be influencing the outcome or the results. And that's how it works in science. You always have something causing something to have an effect on the results. And we will look at that in the next slide. We'll be looking at the cause and effect. And while we go through that, please see what do we call it in science. We don't just call it the cause and the effect. We have specific terminology for that, and I want you to look out for that in the next slide. So if you look here, what is causing what? Can I say the length of the stems is the cause of the temperature increasing? Not at all, this is completely wrong. What is the cause here? The temperature is causing the stems to grow faster, depending on the temperature. Increased temperature increases the growth rate up to a certain point. So what is the cause? The temperature is causing the stems to grow. So aren't these my results? These are my results. And the temperature is the cause, not other way round. So what do we call the cause in science? The cause is always called the independent variable. And the results are always called the dependent variable because they depend 
on the cause. So we must be quick in any investigation to spot what is causing what. It's obvious, it's always obvious, it's not hard. Once you've spotted the cause, that will be the time when you say, okay, you're the cause, you are the independent variable. And here I see the results. The results depend on the cause. It's the dependent variable. As easy as that. I always ask myself the question, is the cat wagging its tail or is the tail wagging the cat? You cannot just say other way around. There's always a cause of something happening. The results depend. It's a dependent variable. So um, let's look at some other examples here. Now identify the independent variable in this case of this specific um, set of information. The independent variable, we said, is the cause. Can you spot the cause there? Is it not temperature? Then you've scored marks now in the, in the test. Look here. The independent variable in this investigation, so the answer will come up now, is temperature. Because the temperature was the cause. So now, moving on, we want to understand what do we mean by validity. We're going to look at validity of the experiment in having a set of data. Can you explain at this point in time, before we go and do some examples, what is the difference between validity in a certain experiment and reliability? As a young scientist moving forward in your career, when you write a report, you want two stamps of approval. You want a stamp of validity and you want a stamp of reliability. It's different. Let's first look at validity. Do you know the English word valid? When is something valid? Isn't it when it's right, it's good, it's perfect? If something is invalid, it's like let's say if you have an invalid ID document, it, it's not right. You may not use it. So we want our scientific investigations always when we do experiments to be valid. Now let's look at a question like to, to show when something is valid. So here the question is asked, in this specific investigation about the temperature, what would make the experiment valid? Now here comes the answer. The learner must keep all factors the same. Everything in the room must stay the same all the time. He will just be changing the factor that he's testing, and that was temperature. He's testing temperature, so he changes the temperature. But he's keeping all the other factors in the room the same. Like what? Like he's going to use only pea plants, not other plants, not some peas and some others. He must keep the same room, the same humidity in the room, the same wind, and you can add many things that he must keep the same. But he just changes one factor, and that's the one that he is testing. He was testing the influence of temperature on the growth rate. So I want to ask you, why do you think is that important when we do an experiment that you keep everything the same, you just change the factor that you're testing? Why is that important? Can you think? Yes, I think you are right. When you change, for instance, let's say you change the temperature in the room by controlling it with the aircon, but you leave the windows open that the wind can blow in. Now the wind has an influence on the leaves. There could be transpiration and other processes happening due to the wind, and it could influence the growth. You're not testing wind at the moment. You're testing temperature. So you must eliminate all the other factors. Then they can put the stamp on to say this is valid. Now that is validity. But what is reliability? It's different. Let's look into reliability. So there are the results again. And now we come to another question in this series of question one. How can he or this learner, he or she, improve the reliability of the investigation? Now I want you to remember the R, 
reliability means R, repeat the investigation, and then you take the average. Now, you know what average is. You just add them all up and you divide by the number that you've added up, and you get the answer. Then you have the average of anything. So for reliability, remember, you repeat the investigation, and then you take the average. Or you could also increase the numbers. The number of plants. This young scientist used only 10. I would not say that is really a reliable investigation. If he perhaps used 100 pea plants, that would have been a much more reliable test. We can compare it to if your principal at school gives you the task to investigate and then write a report on how did the great tens do at school during uh, this term. So you get hold of, there's 200 great tens, and you get hold of five of them, and you ask for their reports, and you see they've done well. And then you, you say to the principal, you write your report, and you make a nice cover and everything, it looks beautiful, and you write there, after my investigation, I found that the learners in grade 10 have done very well. But remember, you've only examined five students. Don't you think your results would have been more reliable if you asked for the reports of 100 learners rather than just the five? So now the principal can say, well done with your investigation. You worked hard. You asked 100 learners, and you found this, and now we can put the stamp of reliability on as well. You've done everything right. It's valid, but we can also put the stamp of reliability. Now, let's look at this question to find the answer on this. How could this learner improve on the reliability of the investigation? And here is the answer. You had to repeat the investigation or increase the number of participants. This is what reliability is all about. Reliability, the R, repeat, or you increase the number of participants. The more, the better. The more reliable will your scientific investigation be, and this applies to all sciences. So what is expected of scientists is to do calculations. And in life sciences, we need to do some simple calculations. Learners can do percentage and average and so on. And if you can't, you must go and find out how to do those. But we find many, many learners around the country struggle with percentage increase. So let's look at a question and then we see, isn't there perhaps a formula we can use that you can just implement and apply when you get questions on increase, percentage increase? Let's see. The question says, calculate the percentage, not just percentage, but percentage increase. Calculate the percentage increase in the stems. From, specifically, day one, moving to day two. Basically, in what percentage did it increase in length? That's what we want to know. So, let's look at the data. Yes, day one and day two, we're interested in that. What happened from the starting point at day one? It grew. But what percentage? It grew from 15 to 18 in millimeters. But when we talk about the percentage, we must look at what we have here. We started at 15 and we went to 18. So here's a little formula I want to give you. At the bottom of the line, you always write the starting point, where you start. And we started here on day one with 15. And at the top, you write the increase because we're calculating percentage increase, and because it's percentage, you multiply by 100 over 1. So let's just uh, put the numbers in here now. Let's substitute the numbers. So the starting point you said is 15. And the increase is how many millimeters? 3. Multiply always by 100 over 1 when you calculate percentage, and when you do this on your calculator, you get an answer of 20% increase. Now, when you get calculations on percentage decrease, you follow the same formula, same thing, and you just call it in the end percentage decrease, because there will still be a difference on top of the line, and then at the bottom, the starting point 
times 100 over 1. We're going to take a short break, grab something to drink with a biscuit to eat, and I'll see you after the break. You are welcome back. And I think you're gaining many skills that you can apply when you do scientific investigations, not only when you do them, but getting you ready for any assessment, a project, or any other assessments you're doing, exams, and so on. And these skills are exam examined and assessed in all projects and tests that you'll be doing from grade 10 right up to university. So let's check what have we done so far. We've done hypothesis testing to see what is a hypothesis. We've also looked at some simple calculations such as percentage and we discussed average. We have looked at the variables. We've spoken about reliability and validity. Do you remember the difference? You do. But now we need to look at that still. And before we get to that, we need to plan the investigation. So as part of hypothesis testing is all about planning because you can't just jump into an experiment you need to plan so let's look at the following hypothesis can you state a hypothesis now i'm sure you can it's a simple prediction do you know the difference between validity and reliability you know it so well and then when you look at the slide here do you know the variables independent dependent and the control variables that you keep the same. But when we talk about hypothesis testing and in our planning, we must have precautions. Precautions go with planning. That is, it means what must we keep in mind to do things right that we don't mess up? What could influence the whole investigation negatively so that it becomes invalid? So let's look at some examples. This was taken from the paper of 2016 from the National Senior Certificate. And it's normally an investigation that you've never seen before, but you need to be able to read with understanding. Really work out and picture in your mind, what is this all about? So let's go to the question. You will be able to do it. A scientist did an investigation in a health individual to determine the effect of drinking water on what? On how much urine is produced. The participant was requested not to eat. Isn't this planning? Yes, it's a precaution even to be sure that you're doing things right. Do not eat or drink before the time because you, it's going to influence the investigation. And then it just gives a bit of extra information that it was conducted over a period of three days. So now, how was this specific investigation done? Let's look at how they described it in the paper of that particular year. The procedure, let's understand this. On day one, the participant noticed one person only was used. He was given this amount of water to drink. On day two, they gave him more water to drink. On day three, they gave him even more, a whole liter to drink. And what happened next? For each day, the amount of urine produced, after giving him those different volumes of water to drink, they then checked how much urine what is the volume of urine that he excreted and it was recorded after four hours for the kidneys to perform their function so which of the following would you now consider as planning steps and this is what we'll be looking at the example in, in this question because you need to plan before you do the experiment you can't just go to the lab and there you are how will you do it who will be your participants are ethics involved ethics means right and wrong with regards to gender and age and religion and, and human rights and so on. You must consider all these things. So you have your precautions and your planning. You think about these things before you do the actual experiment. And we are training you well to become good scientists. Now, this question appeared in the previous paper. It was actually part of a multiple choice question. And the question is all about, can you identify the planning steps here? Let's see. Which of the following are considered to be planning steps? Now, this was found in the National Senior Certificate paper in the year 2016. 
Read the first one. Do you think this is a planning step? Permission was obtained to participate in the investigation. I think this is planning. What about the next one? Yeah, is this planning? The measuring tool to be used was decided upon. Definitely, this is also included in what we call the planning steps. Let's look at some other options. Are they planning? Water was given to the participant. Is that planning? No, it is in the process. It's not planning. It is actually part of the experiment. The amount of urine produced was measured. Now, this was part of the experiment. So it's not part of planning. So planning is you decide what to do, and then you have to take certain precautions. But before we think of the precautions, can you think of some other planning steps? Remember the planning steps we highlighted here? If we just look at the two that were highlighted here. Permission was gr uh, granted, and then the measuring tool was decided upon. Can you think of any other precautions? Things like keeping in mind that you want to make your investigation valid and reliable. In your planning steps, you want to ensure that already. So what can make it reliable? Do you think this investigation was really reliable in testing one person only? Would it not be more reliable if they could have many participants? But that you have to decide. Who will be the participants? How many will be um, used? And then what about ethics, things like their age? Is it not wrong to involve learners in a medical experiment like this that's perhaps under the age of 18? You have to ask yourself those questions and find out. It's all part of planning. So that's the planning part. Let's look at a question that was asked in that um, year about precautions. Let's see. Now the question says, describe two precautions to be taken. And this is where many learners go wrong. They mention the two precautions and then they get two out of four. That is not what you want to score. You don't want to get 50%. Don't just mention the precautions. You must give a reason why you're going to follow that precaution. Then you're going to get for two precautions, make the statement plus a reason, then you get four marks. Always have, apply that rule of giving a reason for your precaution. Now, if you look at what happened here, think back of the question. What precautions could be taken here? And precautions, take note, are not safety measures. Do not say something like, be sure everybody's wearing a mask not to infect one another with corona. It's, it's not that. It's not about safety in this case. Precautions uh, pertain to exactly an experiment, how to be sure that you're doing it right. So let's look at the answer. Or can you think, before I show the answer, can you think of two possible precautions you would take when you would have this experiment of the person giving, we're given water every day more and more, and then we measure the urine produced? What precautions would you take to ensure this whole investigation is right? You are thinking and you perhaps writing it down. I think you are right. Let's have a look at the answer. First of all, all participants that you are going to use should not suffer from any underlying health conditions because, now here comes the reason. Here's the reason. So you always want to give a reason with your statement that you're making. It should not have an underlying health condition. Why? because it could affect the functioning of the kidneys, and then your whole experiment will be wrong. You can't use these people. It's a precaution. Another precaution. The participant should not eat or drink four hours before the time to ensure that the liquid consumption prior to the investigation does not influence. We want our investigation to be valid. We can't give the person, allow him just to drink as much as he wants before the time because it's going to have an influence on the results. We want our results to be a fair test, so we don't want it to influence the volume of urine produced. Here is the second precaution you've given to and you've stated the reasons why we should um, implement this. So 
to summarize, we've been talking about planning and precautions in setting up an experiment. Look at the steps that you have to follow. You need to understand the scientific process because you are young scientists with a bright future. Let's have a look. First of all, you start off with the investigative question. Something like, what is the influence of temperature on growth? That is what you're wondering about. So it's a question. Now you're wondering about this. So you identify your variables, independent, dependent, and what will you control? Control means the things you keep the same. So the independent, the dependent, and what will you keep the same? Now you make a prediction. This is your hypothesis. And now you plan a certain method on how you will do it and never forget the ethics behind things, keeping in mind human rights, religion, and so on. So this is all we have time for in this segment. So now we're going to go into a short break. And when I see you again, we'll be discussing the uh, uh, information with regards to interpreting data, especially in graphs. I'll see you just now. So welcome back. I'm sure you've gained a lot of skills today. We said skills are important, not only knowledge, especially in science. Let's see what we've done so far. By now, you can write a hypothesis. I'm, I have that confidence in you. You can do calculations as we describe percentage increase and decrease. We've spoken about the two stamps that you need on your report, reliability and validity, and you know the difference between the two. We've spoken about the three variables, dependent, independent, and the controlled variables. But what we haven't really focused on is the skill to interpret data and graphs. Now, that is what the whole investigation builds up to. You plan your investigation, you do it, but in the end, you need to be able to interpret the graph. Not only interpret it, but we're going to see the logical collecting of data and how to present it and then drawing graphs. Let's have a look at that. The first thing that you want to do after collecting the data, and you do, have done the experiment, you collect it, you want to present it in some logical way, and then you want to analyze it. Analyzing is really thinking about what's happening here, and um, so you want to tabulate it first of all. Put it nicely in a table. Then a graph is such a clear representation of to spot trends. That is why we like graphs. And you interpret the graphs to draw certain conclusions. So let's have a look at tabulation. Learners, I want you to remember whenever you do any assessments, it could be a project, a nice project your teacher is giving you. When you put your data that you've collected, you've done that interesting investigation, you want to remember a few things when it comes to tabulation. Let's see. You want to give a heading, first of all. Uh, any information without a heading becomes useless because any reader will ask, why, what is this all about? So if you have a heading, it gives direction to what's happening here. Then your columns must be clearly labeled. And whenever you have any measurements, because that's what science is about, exact science is about measurements, let's say, millimeters or degrees Celsius. You always put that in brackets. I'm going to show you an example. Look at this example. Here's a very nice example of a table. Now you've gathered your results, you put it in the table. What you do, you give a heading. Do you think this heading makes it clear what this investigation is all about? I think so. Please read there. It makes it very clear. Then we list the cause, which we called the independent variable. We list it normally first, and then we write the values in, but do not forget the unit. You do not write the units in each little block here. No. You write it in the beginning. The same here with this unit, and you put in your stats there. So these are a few things. When learners go wrong with this, and then they uh, do not... Uh, fulfill the, the, they don't become proper scientists in doing the, the things right. So, when we collect the data, 
we have a table, as we said, but a table is sometimes hard to interpret because it's a lot of numbers. So it's very nice to show it in the form of graph. So when we talk about graphs, in life sciences you get instruction to draw a specific graph. If they say draw a line graph, then you should not draw a bar graph. They give specific instructions in life sciences. So we need to be sure that our headings are right. We spoke about headings before when we spoke about uh, headings in the table. A graph, if you have a beautiful graph and it has no heading, it is useless because everybody will ask, what is this all about? Is it perhaps the results of the grade tens at your school for life sciences? If it has a heading, then you know what it's all about. But you must also label the axis. And you must properly put it at the right place, the y axis and the x axis, and give it units. Let's look here on the board. Label the axis, and when you talk about scale the axis, it means you must have the proper intervals as you go along. And when you move, you will write 2, 4, 6, for instance, as an example. You can't then write 7. That's incorrect scale. Then you're simply going to plot your points, draw the graph, and in life sciences, this normally counts 6 marks. Let's look at an example. This is an example we spoke about earlier. And here the instruction is specifically draw a line graph. Then you're going to do nothing else but that. A line graph It's on a question we've seen before to indicate the influence of what? Of temperature on growth on pea plants. We have seen that. Let's look at how one will represent the data from here, which is sometimes hard to spot the trends. We can look at the trends here. It's a bit hard to look at the numbers, so we put it in a graph, and look how nice it is, because a graph is a visual representation. It tells us a story just like a picture. Many of us as teachers have seen that some learners are a bit intimidated by graphs. You don't have to be intimidated because you look at, is the line going up? It tells you a story. Is it going down or staying the same? As simple as that. Now, there's, there's a few steps that you need to remember when you draw the graph before we get to the interpretation of the graph. Now, let's look at that. When you draw the graph, I recommend you write the heading first. Why? Because I've seen so many learners, including myself, I get so involved in drawing the graph that I forget the heading in the end. You write the heading first. Look at this heading. Do you think it's a good heading? The influence of temperature on the growth of Pisum sativum, which are the, the pea plants. You're making it clear. And I rather recommend that learners move away from this in life sciences, where they say temperature versus growth. This is not correct. Make it clear what the graph is all about. You can do it. Then you decide what comes on the y-axis. And remember, it's always your results that you're gathering that comes here on the y-axis. What comes on the x-axis is the, the independent variable, the cause, the factor causing what should happen. Always comes on the x-axis. You plot your points, and then you're ready to score, as we said, normally, Six marks are allocated to this. But now you want to interpret patterns here. You want to understand what can I learn from this? What conclusions can I make? So just to see what we've done so far, we've tabulated our information. You've drawn a graph which is so easy on the eye, but we all as scientists want to see the what? The trends. So let's look at an example of that. So how will you interpret a graph? When you want to understand what's happening, you want to first of all look at the what? The heading. And then you look at the axis. That's immediately where you focus your eyes. And then you see, is the line going up? Or is it coming down? It means something is decreasing. Or is it staying the same? It's telling me a story. And then you can read certain values. And we will be looking at example or an example just now of how one can read values. But I have to add that reading off values, you've done it since primary school even. From a graph, we're going to look at an example now. This example comes from work that's done uh, with regards to homeostasis and uh, the functioning of the pancreas. Uh, we will look at a graph because Life sciences, you will always find that you have to draw a graph in the paper, 
or also interpret graphs. And we're going to look at an example of that just now. So here we have a question that's adapted from the year 2018 from the National Senior Certificate. And um, let's have a look. Study the graph and then answer the questions that follow. Very nice question about, and when I show you the slide and when we discuss it, look at the trends. What is glucose doing after a meal in your blood? Is it increasing? Remember, a graph, tell, a graph tells a story. And what is insulin doing? Spot the trends going up and down. Let's have a look. So we start off here at 8 o'clock. The arrows indicate meals. So here we start off, and we, show, we see here the person at 8 o'clock had a meal. At 12 o'clock, the question paper told me had another meal. And here the person had another meal. So three times a day, he or she ate. But before we can look at the details here, the very first thing that we must do, we must go to the heading. What is this graph all about? It's the effects of eating large meals. You know, some people have six meals a day, but smaller. This person had how many meals? I see here three. But the heading tells me large meals, the effect on what? On blood glucose. But also, there's two graphs here in one. Look at the solid line. The solid line gives me the pattern or the trend for glucose in the person's blood. And the insulin is the dotted line here showing what's happening in the person's blood as the day goes by. Now, can you spot any interesting features here? Let's go through this together. And as we discuss it, see if you can follow along with me this roller coaster ride that's happening in your body. We can draw some of your blood and test the glucose levels and the insulin levels. Do you know what is normal? We, we refrain normally from using the word normal. But when it comes to medical aspects, there is a normal. Like, you should have a specific value of glucose, a concentration of glucose in your blood. And I want to show you that normal. Here it is. 100. 100 what? I must read here on the axis here and the label of the axis. Blood glucose and insulin concentration in milligram per deciliter. It's shown here. And it's increasing there. But what's normal? Here's the line going. There's the line. This is normal for what? For glucose. Now here's the person. He or she wakes up early in the morning and then the glucose is what? Is it normal? Because here is normal. No, it's below normal. Have you ever had that feeling where you feel you're going to faint because your blood glucose levels, the concentration, is too low. The brain cells are not getting enough glucose. So, now the person eats. The food is digested. At this point, the food is then absorbed in the blood. And it actually goes above normal. It becomes actually too high. It must be brought back to normal again. Now, this is where the messenger comes in. Remember... Insulin is a hormone, and hormones are chemical messengers. They detect, the organs where they release from detect the problem, and then they are secreted in the blood, and they cause things to happen. Can you see what insulin is causing here? Let's see. Insulin is causing the glucose after insulin has been released, because look at the dotted line. Insulin is going up. Now, when insulin is high in concentration in the blood, it gives the message that glucose must be reduced, and then it is reduced. It comes back to normal. But now the person hasn't eaten from 8 to 12, so in fact it becomes a bit low again. And then he's going to eat, and it goes up again. But it's dangerous if it stays too high, so the messenger comes into play again, and it comes down. So let's look at, at a few examples of questions. Let's um, move to a question to see, um, I just want to move to a question here. This is adapted from a paper in 2018. Use the graph to determine the times of the day when the blood glucose would be at its lowest. Remember the word minimum means the lowest. So 
when you look at the low points, we're always interested to look at the high points because it tells us a story, and then you read it off there from the y-axis. You can get the value there. But in this question, ask, where is the glucose, where are the glucose levels at the lowest? Now you look there, there's a low level. So you write, I see it is not at 8 o'clock because here's 8 o'clock. So it is just before 8 o'clock, let's say 7.45. It was at its lowest. But there's another time when it was at the lowest. There. So you read down the time there. And then there's another time when it was low. It was run about 4 o'clock when it was at its lowest. So now we're ready to answer the question. Use, so it was the previous question here. This question on the times of the day. We spotted them on the graph and you're ready to write them down. So if you go to the next graph or the next question, use the graph to describe the relationship between blood glucose and then the concentration of insulin. Let's briefly have a look here. So learners, can you spot the trend in this graph? Can you see when glucose increases, what happens to the insulin? it also increase. You can see as the one goes up, the other one. But notice here, when the one is at a peak, the other one is the peak a bit later. There's a delay. Look here as well. There's the peak of glucose and the insulin follows a bit later. So in conclusion, what have we discussed? You know what hypothesis now is in the whole planning process. We've done some simple calculations and you're going to practice them. We have done the variables. And we know now how to make an investigation reliable and how to make it valid. And we ended off the whole discussion by the important aspect of interpreting and presenting data and graphs. And I want to say to you, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening so well. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again.